read today from the scripture from Ephesians 4.11. Stand for the reading of God's word. It says, I therefore, the prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live worthily of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Amen. You may be seated. Today's sermon and second in a series, I am a church member, is I will be a member of unity. Amen. Church membership is more than getting your name on the roll. It's different from the perks and privileges of a social club. We talked about that last week. Church membership is about sacrificing, <laughs> giving, and forgiving. I said it again. Church membership is about sacrificing, giving, and forgiving. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. How do we a unifying church? <coughs> God desires for Christians to get along. Amen. I know you can't tell that by the way the church is today. There's so many different denominations and so many different segregations that we do in churches. You can't tell that that's what God intended. Last week we talked about the, the body of Christ and how we're all one body. If you try chopping your body up, it's not very useful. Amen. So it's the same with the church. Amen. The reason Paul used the illustrations to let you know, God expects the church to be a body, but also expects it to be unified. Amen. Imagine if your left leg wanted to go one way and your right leg wanted to go the other. <laughs> what would happen? You wouldn't get very far. Well, your right hand says, I'm going to do this. The left hand says, but in the body, you're coordinated. Amen? Amen. In fact, we, when folks can't, aren't coordinated, we, we can say, you're not very coordinated. Throw a baseball to them and they're all over the place trying to catch it, right? But at some point with practice, they get really good at it. Amen. Church is a team sport. Amen. How many of y'all played on a sports team? Uh, I, know, I know Brother Eric is a phenomenal basketball player. Brother Eric, what, what, what's it like when the five players don't work together? Don't win too many games. Amen. One of the things we like about the San Antonio Spurs is they're a team. Even without superstars, they do pretty good because they work as a team. And when you work as a team together, good things happen. You can win. You can win when the odds are against you. The Spurs won five championships without any real what you call superstars. Tim Duncan was, but he wasn't one of those famous prima donna superstars. Yeah. He was a quiet, unassuming man that worked hard. Right. And that team won five championships because they worked together as a team. They all came together and said, despite our differences, you had a guy from Argentina named Nobley, a guy from France named Tony Parker. You had, you had Tim Duncan, I think, was from the Caribbean or something yeah. like that. So all these folks from these different places came together to win championships. Amen. And it's the same in church. God brings a bunch of different people together and wants him to work in unity. God desires for us to get along. Here's what Jesus said in John 12, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Amen. And that's not that love where I love you, you love me. Y'all, <laughs> that's that love that endures through everything. The good, the bad, the ugly. One of the things I do when I do premarital counsel is I warn couples, you're going to have to love the good, the bad, and the ugly, especially that bad and ugly part. Because <laughs> it's not like the movies where, you know, we get up and look like we just walked out of the makeup room. It's amazing. Somebody slept all night and the hair's still in place. And, you know, the breast smells like perfume and all that. No, it didn't work that way. Sometimes when you get up, you look at each other and go, ooh, I'm glad I love you. <laughs> Amen? Amen. But that's what God expects of the body of Christ, that we're going to operate that way. The world will know we're Christians, not by the way we say we are, but what we actually do. Huh. I'll tell you a story. The church I grew up in, had, it, it was a phenomenal church. Pastor by a young pastor named Dr. Jameson. Dr. Jameson had a church that was unbelievable. In fact, God moved so powerfully that everyone throughout the state of New Jersey knew about this church. I met someone literally 30 years afterwards when I, when I saw, mentioned the name Halltown. 
his eyes lit up and said, oh my God, God moved there. He was a totally interracial church, blacks, whites, and Hispanics, all worshiping together. Mind, this is in the early 60s. And I'm telling you, miracles used to happen at this church. People were getting healed. Not headache healings, actual healing. People getting healed of cancer and diabetes. And, all, and right there, God was moving. The church was awesome and growing and growing. And it was just growing, growing leaps and bounds. And I remember this is the church I was born into. I have a little video I'll show you all one sometime with me running around. As a, I think it was about two, three years old, running around the church grounds and they were videoing, videoing some stuff. But it was growing. And then it happened. Folks stopped serving God and started serving themselves. And before long, and I, I remember, I, I think I was maybe four or five, I was at the church meeting with my mom when the pastor decided to step down because of a bunch of gossip and stuff that happened within the church. The, the assistant pastor had decided that he and his wife decided they wanted to run the church. And it tore the church up. That church never recovered. Half the church went one way, the other half went the other. When I was about five or six, we visited the church again, and it was empty. So this powerful move of God was stopped because the enemy sowed discord in the church and destroyed it. Now, I want to tell you something about how I choose what I'm going to preach on. I choose what I'm going to preach on weeks in advance. I don't get up on Saturday morning and decide what I'm going to preach. Everything I do is, is, is I teach in series because I like to prepare what I'm doing. Same with Bible study. I do everything in advance. And when it came to this one, I looked and said, wow, God, this is an interesting subject I'm going to be teaching on in two weeks. But it's an important subject. Because as I look around the AME church, I look around other churches in our denomination, and other churches, period, there is a destruction going on with their churches. Churches are falling to the wayside. Churches go out of business every day. And one of the main reasons is we're, we're not unified. See, the world sees this from us. They come to business meetings and see how we talk about each other and how we don't get along and think that's the church. <coughs> they, they hear us gossiping about each other and talking about each other and think that's the church. The letters and emails and phone calls that we give to pastors and other leaders in the church, they think that's how the church runs. And because of that, a lot of them don't want anything to do with the church. And that's a problem. There are plenty of churches like the one I grew up in, Halltown, that, that were going along really good and then the devil got inside the church and tore it up because people decided to do something besides unity. See, God expects that when we become a Christian, he wants us to be part of the church. He demands that we become a unifying presence there. He expects us to be part of what the church is doing and where the church is going. If you say you're a believer, then you should be all about unity. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? Because that's what God expects. And if you're not about that, then you need to get in front of God and say, God, I need, I, help me out. Unity is important. It's critical. When church members don't work together, the church is weaker as a whole. You see the picture of that church up there? That's an old broken down church. That's what happens to churches when they don't move with God, they try to move against God. And what does that mean? What that means is we don't see God's mission and vision and work together to get what God wants accomplished. When you don't do that, you destroy the work of God because what he'll do, he'll remove himself from it. And you don't want that to happen. That's what happened to my church when I grew up. Every church member must be must contribute to the unity and health of the church. Everybody is important to it. You can't have one or two folk over here disgruntled and, and let that sit. You've got to figure out a way. How do we unify that? How do we keep ourselves 
focus on the right thing. Unity is very, very important. Unity, here, here's what Paul urged us. Read this with me. This is, we just read this. To walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds. Humility means I know who I am compared to God. And I'm humbled by that. Gentleness means that I do things in a gentle manner. I'm patient. I accept one another in love. We've got to let love rule what we do. And this isn't just about church. Think about families. I always tell the story of, of my family and family reunions. The same uncles would get in a fight every single time we got together. I'm telling you, every, it, 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 and it was always right before the, the homemade ice cream would get ready to get served. <laughs> Everybody grab the kids. Come on, let's get out of here. You know, same, um, uh, same uncles fight every single time. It's like, what in the world is going on there? So within that family, there was a unity, and their families torn apart right now today inside of churches because they won't unify together. That's sad. Maintaining unity. We have a responsibility as a church member to be a source of unity, to never be a divisive force, and when to love our fellow church members unconditionally. What does that mean? That means I love you no matter what. You may not be doing right, but I'm still going to love you. You may talk about me, I'm still going to love you. you. You may look at me sideways, I'm still going to love you. That's what unconditional love is, and that's one of the keys to a church staying together and moving forward where God wants. The enemy doesn't like that. The enemy wants to come in and tear churches up that are trying to move together. Why? Because if he can destroy the church, he destroys the members. Because we all need to be together. Think about a body being severed apart. It doesn't live. It's the same with the body. So we have to be willing to sacrifice our own preferences Keep unity in church. Gossip. See that lady crying up there? Hello? I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> Nothing will destroy a church worse than gossip. Amen. Amen. Gossip is bad. It's destructive. It tears apart the unity and renders the church powerless. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by gossip? Rebel, huh? Bad yeah. <laughs> Gossip is when you're talking about someone and you're not talking about them to pray for them. You're talking about them just to talk about them. Amen. That means you saw someone in sin and instead of praying for them Amen. and praying with them, Amen. you got over it. You know, I'm just concerned. I saw Brother So-and-so over doing such and such. <laughs> Ooh, Lord Jesus. I saw Sister So-and-so. Mm -hmm, well, she was she standing, she was talking to some man in the restaurant. I, I went to a church once where the, a rumor got out that the pastor was, was at lunch with a white woman. The white woman was his wife. Amen. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. Have mercy. That's gossip, half truths, or you know, you hear a little something, something here, and people start getting spun up about it. Say that. It tears a church apart. Say that. God has something to say about it. Let's read Romans. They are all filled with every kind of unrighteousness, wickedness, covetousness, malice. They are ripped with envy, murder, strife, deceit, hostility. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, contrivers of all sorts of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, covenant breakers, heartless, ruthless. All they fully know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, that do not only do them, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, this part of Scripture comes right after God talks about sexual sin. The church has forgotten these verses, though. In some churches, they'll talk about all kinds of, you know, you know, hey, sexual orientations, what we like and don't like, and then leave this part out. God doesn't like this either. So we have to guard against that. We have to make sure that we're not part of this because if we're part of this, what happens is you tear the church up. And if you look at churches in America today, there's a whole lot of this going on. A whole lot of it. James 3.6 talks about something. 
And the tongue is a fire. The tongue represents the yes, world wrongdoing among the parts of our body. It pollutes the entire body, sets fire in the course of human existence, and is set on fire by hell. Listen now. For every kind of animal, bird, reptile, and sea creature is subdued and has been subdued by humankind, but no human being can subdue the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father. With it we curse people made in God's image. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. These things should not be so, my brothers and sisters. A spring does not pour out fresh water and bitter water from the same opening, does it? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers and sisters, or a vine produce figs? Neither can salt water spring fresh produce. Wow. This is the Bible. There's a reason God has it there. Because we have to understand, we talk about it all the time, the power of life and death is in the tongue. We can kill each other with our tongue. When someone is in trouble or in sin or out doing stuff, we shouldn't be talking about them. We should be praying for them. If I, don't, if, I, if I don't see somebody in church for a few weeks, I get concerned. I don't talk about it. I'm like, hey, have you heard from Brother So? And then I start praying, God, whatever's wrong, Man. fix it. Mm. Satan, you're a liar. Get off that person right now in the name of Jesus. Why? Because I'm concerned for their soul. We all make mistakes. Excuse me, let me, let me correct that. We all sin. Amen. If you don't think you sin, say that. Your stuff just had not been exposed. Yet. Come on. Say it. Some of us step up in church and get away. I you know, I'm not like so uh -huh, yeah. this. But I guarantee if we look inside your heart, if we saw the secret things you were doing that we don't know about, you would want church to know about. I thank God y'all don't know what I do. And I'm humbled by it because I realize I still need God's help. And that's why I constantly pray for people for every one of you because I want you to understand God loves you, God will forgive you and I don't want you out there sinning too long. Amen. And I'm always going to work to pray you back in. Amen. Now if you decide not to come to church because you don't like me, well, you know, I can't do that about that. <laughs> but if you're out not doing what you're supposed to do, I'm going to constantly pray and encourage you because you need to be in church. I don't care. My grandmother used to tell me, I don't care what you're doing, have your behind in church on Sunday morning. Uh, <laughs> what? I was out late Saturday night to be in church anyway. You know why I need to be in church? Because I kept hearing the convicting word of God. I kept hearing the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit worked on me until I got it right. Amen. Amen. Telling you. Sister Shirley and I were talking about this yesterday. I remember when I was growing up, we were in church all day. We, oh my God, we'd come early for Sunday school, stay through a long service. Go home for a quick bite to eat and come from Sunday night Amen. service. Anybody remember that? Amen. That was church. Mm. Now church is two hours. We can't get folks to come. Mm. Mm. Hello? <laughs> two hours out of our day. We're not even saying be here for Sunday night. When, you know, I'm, and my dad being a preacher, man, if we had a week, one week revival, I had to be there every single night. Oh, <laughs> revival. I had to, oh, Lord. <laughs> And you know, preachers, they all get together after service and talk. So I would be in the car to sleep, you know, <laughs> call preachers to talk. Well, Nowadays, again, we have church on TV, church on the internet. We have, you can't get folks to come to church. Because we have lost our ability to attract people because they don't see God. <laughs> Here's how you respond to gospel. Don't be a source of gossip. That's the first step. Don't be someone who gossips. Keep your tongue under control. <laughs> My grandmother used to say, if you don't have nothing good to say about anybody, don't say anything. I used to talk about giving two people peace of my mind until my aunt said, if you can give peace, people peace of mind, you're going to have a mind. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll leave. Hello. We, we, if someone in the church begins to share gossip with you, say, no, I'm not going to get it. Let's, let's pray for that person. 
Because when you're praying for people, it's a whole lot better coming out of your mouth than what you can possibly gossip. But here's something else that hurts churches. What does that say? Everybody read that. Forgiveness and unity. Let's read it again. Forgiveness and unity. Jesus said, for if you forgive people that are wrongdoing, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing. Wait, what? No, so I'm down and ask God to forgive me for my sins, but I have unforgiveness against my brother and sister in the church. Hello. That means God is not going to forgive me. <laughs> Wait, what? Huh. Families, churches, organizations have been destroyed because of unforgiveness. Somebody did something 20 years ago and was still holding it against them. <laughs> God can't bless you that way. He can. Your brother, your flesh brother did something to you. That's like my uncles always fighting. Why? Because they couldn't forgive one another for something that had happened before any of us were ever born. <laughs> fighting, busting. How many of y'all have seen that happen in your family? <laughs> still over the same stuff. It's like 20 years later. Why are we still fighting over this? <laughs> because we haven't forgiven one another. And that's the key. So and so talked about me. Forgive them. So and so looked at me funny. Forgive them. So and so said such such. Forgive them. Because if you don't forgive them, God can't forgive you. That's what it says. In the Lord's Prayer, what does it say? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So if you don't forgive the folks doing you wrong, No, I'm supposed to fight back. No, you're not. That's why the word said, turn the other cheek to hit you on one cheek, turn the other one, let him hit. I know we had that whole, yeah, that third time I'm going to hit him on the You have to forgive. Married couples have destroyed their marriage because of unforgiveness. Fathers and children and mothers and children have destroyed relationships because of lack of forgiveness. Brothers and sisters who don't talk because of lack of forgiveness. Because we won't forgive. What does forgive mean? Forgive means they come to you and say, I'm sorry I did it. You say, I forgive you and you let it go. Uh -huh. What? Let it go. Because if you hang on to it, then you didn't forgive them. I can't do that. I know you can't. That's why you need Jesus. <laughs> Without the love of God flowing through you, allowing the Holy Spirit to heal your heart and to heal where you are, you will never be able to forgive people. And without that forgiveness, God can't forgive you. I don't know about you, but I want God to forgive me. So I have to forgive others. And that's not easy, is it? It's not. But it's the God way of doing things. When you walk in forgiveness and walk in love, God can fix anything. Yes, can. What did we talk about a few weeks ago about Peter? Peter who denied Christ three times and Jesus forgave him like it didn't happen. Yeah. What? Yeah, that's how it works. And Peter went on to do mighty things for the Lord. Don't you want God to forget what you did? Don't you want God to forgive you for what you did? Amen. And forget about it? Then we have to do the same thing. We have to be willing to forgive things that we haven't let go yet. Sometimes it's rivalries that, that existed between cities. Sometimes it's rivalries that existed between families. Sometimes it's divorces that cause unforgiveness. Sometimes it's, it's unwed children. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Something you have a child, there's, there's, there's unforgiveness there. I've seen it. I've experienced it in my own life. At Hall Town, that's what happened. It wasn't just gossip, it was unforgiveness. People wouldn't forgive that tore that church to pieces. 
there's a big church in Austin, about five, six hundred members, and they were getting ready to build a brand new building. And the church split. <coughs> Hang on now. The church split because half the church wanted blue carpet, another church wanted white carpet. <laughs> And they couldn't compromise to get the church. So they have two churches now. All blue carpet and all orange carpet. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> but that's how we are. That's the stuff we argue about. That's the stuff we don't forgive each other about. That festers on. Think about the Hatfields and the McCoys. They kept a, a decades-on feud going over a pig. <laughs> A pig. Some folks probably forgot why they were feuding. Why don't, I don't like you? I don't know, but I don't like you. You're happy. I'm a boy, so you know. Man, shoot man. Forgot what we even arguing about. Forgiveness is important because without it, the church will tear apart. Amen. Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with a heart of mercy kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If someone happens to have a complaint against anyone else, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also forgive others. That means you forgive them before they ask you to forgive them. What? Yeah. Because sometimes they're not going to ask you. But you can't hold on to that thing. you got to let it go. Now that's opposite of what the world tells us to do. <coughs> Look what's happening right now with our country. We're firing off at another country. I'm not even sure why. And it could lead to war. We just sang the song, I'm, I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. But the battlefield for the Lord doesn't mean we're fighting each other. We're supposed to be fighting the enemy. That means if you have unforgiveness in your heart, you need to let it go. you got to let it go. Because God didn't die for unforgiveness. Jesus died to forgive us. If you think that someone's done you wrong, We've done God even worse. Amen. Amen. God created us. He gave us dominion over the earth. He has blessed us with so many things that we spit in his face mm -hmm. all the time. And some of the worst part of those of us who call ourselves Christians. Okay. We're the reason some folks don't come to church. Amen. Well. Yeah. Hmm. So that's the same as spitting in God's face. When you say, God, I love you, but I'm going to treat people horrible. God, I love you, but I'm not going to show love. God, I love you, but I'm not going to forgive so-and-so. God, I love you, but I'm going to gossip about so-and-so. God, I love you, but I'm going to try to do what I can to tear up the church because I don't like something. Really? Is that what you want God to do to you? <clears throat> we deserve death for what we do. We deserve death for what we do. And yet Jesus came down and died on a cross to forgive us. The first words he uttered when he was on the cross is he looked down at his very people. He looked out at the church folk that were yelling crucify. He looked out at the church people that were mocking him and said, Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. That's the key. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, you can never have a united church. And unforgiveness will come out in many, many ways. You direct it at other people, really what it is, I got something right here that I'm really upset about. There's something that I've never dealt with that's causing me to act out. Amen. That's usually unforgiveness. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you what I know. There were people I had to forgive. But 
before God when you were sick. There's this weight that was hanging on me and people that I had done things and I just couldn't forgive them. And until I forgave them, God didn't use me. And I had to learn how to look on love on people that had done me wrong. People who had talked about me. And still love them the way God loves me because I had to. Because I wanted God to forgive me. If you have anything against anybody, you've got to get that thing taken care of. Don't let it fester. It will destroy you. You just heard God's word. If you don't forgive them, he can't forgive you. If he doesn't forgive you, where do you end up? I'm not sure about you. I don't want to go to heaven. There's no person I know worth me going to hell for. You have to forgive. You have to let God come into your heart and melt that hardness and forgive. No matter what it was they did. No matter, no matter what they said. You've got to let it go. I had to forgive my oldest daughter's mother. Had to. She never asked for it, but I did anyway. Because it was holding me back. I had to forgive my parents for things they did. Because it was holding me back. I had to forgive friends who had done me wrong. Because it was holding me back. I had to forgive preachers who had done me wrong. Because it was holding me back. I had to forgive so that God could move me forward. And that's important for our church. Stand your feet.